Hello, hello, welcome in. We're just going to give everyone a few minutes before we get started. Welcome, guys. Here they come. Just another few moments before we get started here. Appreciate the patience. I'm seeing some familiar names. Hello. All right, maybe 30 more seconds and we'll get started. All right, we'll begin. We'll let people kind of follow, uh, funnel in as we kind of kick this off. Uh, first of all, welcome. Uh, thanks for joining us. We're excited to show you what we've kind of put together here. I think uh, there's going to be a lot of cool stuff that you'll walk away with and, and appreciate your patience, patience as we get started here. All right, so today we're going to be talking about Sitecore XMCloud migrations powered by AI. As your host, you're going to have myself. I'm Kevin Suarez Melendez. I'm a lead architect and Sitecore MVP here at Accentium. And joining us, we have Sergey. Sergey, can you please introduce yourself? Hello, everyone. My name is Sergey Tsenko. I'm a director and architect at Accentium, and I'm certified in, in a whole bunch of different things, including Azure Cloud and AI. Oh. Awesome. Thanks, Sergey. So today, we're going to be talking about AI. And I know AI is likely not new to anyone here. It's kind of hard for it to be new, right? We see AI everywhere. We see that AI is going to change the world. It's going to make our lives better, and it's going to transform everything. And while a lot of that might be true, sometimes it's hard to understand how all of these promises and all of these possibilities actually impact me. How do they impact my project? How do they impact my day-to-day? -day? So what we're hoping to do today is to show you that first, it's not rocket science. You can do it and you can start using it right now in your real projects and really show you how Gen AI is transforming the process of migrating from Sitecore non-XM cloud to XM cloud. And of course, a lot of this is going to apply uh, to other things just outside of a migration. So from just, hey, this isn't rocket science, you can start using it today. We also want you to walk away with two main things. First, we want to show you how this is going to help you reduce dev time and cost. And by that, what I mean is if a typical task or feature takes 100% of that full time, half of that time typically goes to scaffolding or creating the, the skeleton of that feature. And then the other half goes into applying business logic or tweaking it to really get it across the finish line. With AI, we're hoping to really reduce that first half of the scaffolding and that hello world scaffold of that feature to almost zero. It won't be zero, but close. And as a result, we're hoping to get these projects live quicker and to market. Before we see how AI is going to play a pivotal role throughout this step or this process, let's first understand what our journey looks like. And we're going to be looking at a hyper simplified view of perhaps your digital ecosystem. For example, search or other modules you may have uh, installed aren't included here. 
So we're going to focus on the three core pillars. So on a non-XM cloud solution, your solution is mainly composed of content. So your pages, your data sources, and other Sitecore items like templates, renderings, and everything else inside of that CM instance. You also have your presentation layer. So this is your controllers that pull the data together, apply business logic, and pass it over to the view for the users to finally see that. <laughs> Give me one moment. You can't prepare for these type of things. Let's see. All right, I hope I'm on, on view again. Oh, there we go. Uh, all right. Apologies for that. And finally, if you're on XP, you'll have a pres personalization layer on top of that. On the XM cloud side of things, you're going to see something very similar. You're going to have those same three pillars. But instead, now each one of these pillars does one thing, and it does that one thing very well. So for example, on the content side, that'll be your CM instance in XM Cloud. And its role is to manage content and deliver it headlessly to power those omni-channel experiences. Your presentation now can be a single app or multiple apps. For example, it can be a mobile app, it could be a Next.js app, and it's decoupled from your content. And if you're coming from XP or you want to start leveraging personalization, You'll layer in a personalization engine on top of those two core pillars, perhaps Sitecore Personalize. Now for the scope of this conversation, we're not gonna be talking about that personalization migration, but it's definitely a topic we wanna follow up on. So let's get started. Let's see where AI is gonna help us. And we're gonna start with content, which if you've done migrations, you know that that's maybe a little backwards. You know, you usually start with your features, you'll bring in, uh, you either migrate or recreate a feature on the platform, then the content. And Sergey is actually going to show us how to do exactly that. But for the purposes of the content piece, we're going to assume that that has been done already. And to further paint that picture of what's been done, we're going to say that, hey, our blog feature has been migrated or recreated in XM Cloud. So now business comes to us and says, hey, that's great. We have this feature in XM Cloud. Now we want to migrate all of our blog articles over to our new XM Cloud instance. And I'm sure we've all done content migration before. We know it's not a simple one-to-one -one mapping. And even the simple criteria of all blog articles is not always the case. For example, you might have certain criteria that the content needs to match before it gets exported and then imported into your new system. You may also run into the issue where your schema doesn't match between the two platforms, so you have to handle that. So a content migration typically breaks down into three main steps. You have your export, your transform, and your import. We're going to go through each one of these and see how AI is helping us accelerate these processes. So for exporting, we're going to go straight to AI. In this case, I'm using ChatGPT. doesn't have to be that. And we're going to prompt it to basically do exactly what we need it to do. We're going to say, hey, write me a PowerShell script. Make sure that the, the PowerShell script is going to export items. Make sure that the items it exports match a criteria. In this case, those items need to be updated within the last two years. Finally, put them all together and give me some results. Now, we're going to see the code that this outputs, but we're not going to do a deep dive on the code. So if, if you're not a developer, you don't fully understand it, it's completely fine. But I want to point out a few cool things that this is doing. First, because of the way we wrote this prompt, it was able to give us two key variables. It gave us a root path, which is essentially where the content we want to export lives in. And it gave us a template property, which now allows us to specify what type of content or template the content we want to export. And another neat thing that it did is near the bottom, when I gave it the instruction of, hey, aggregate these results and show them in a treeless dialogue. Well, to me, that made sense when I wrote it, but it actually doesn't make sense in the context of Sycor PowerShell extensions and outputting a report. But because the AI was able to understand my intent and the context, it was able to fix that for me and instead use the right command, show list view, to give me some results. And running this particular script gives me this output. Now, I want to emphasize that this script may not be complete. 
right? I may want to come into this script. I may want to add properties or I want to remove properties or tweak and enhance little things to, again, get it across the finish line. But what's pivotal here is that it got me from nothing to something very close to done in a matter of a few minutes. And now that I have my report of all of the items that I want, maybe I tweaked it a little bit to get it across the finish line, I'll go ahead and export it perhaps in JSON format. Well, we have a problem. Our schema and the current system and the new system don't match. In the current system, we have a single field with all of the content for the article. In the new system, we've broken that out into fields to better componentize that data. So how do we get from A to B? Well, let's ask AI to do that for us. Hey, take that HTML that we just saw and extract the pieces that I care about, the title, the main image, the author, the rest of the content, and essentially export it all out for me. And while you're at it, our new schema has a field that didn't exist before, a summary field. Hey, while you're transforming this, also generate that value for me. And here's what it outputs. And it does a pretty good job, of course, I always say, hey, you would want to have somebody review this, make sure that it aligns with what you're expecting, but it's a great starting point. Again, we're reducing the need to start from zero. Now, the keen eye of you may have noticed, hey, I have hundreds, if not thousands of articles. Am I gonna have to do this for every single one? And the answer is yes, but not by hand, right? If this is the approach you wanna take, you would then develop a small tool that would leverage OpenAI's API or SDK to essentially iterate through all of those exported data points and do this for you automatically. All right, so now we have our data. We've transformed it into our new schema. Now we have to import it. Similarly to before, we're gonna go straight to the AI and prompt it, and we're gonna tell it, hey, here's that new JSON object of what an article looks like. Again, write me a Sitecore PowerShell script that goes through this data and it imports that into Sitecore. And we can see that it does just that. And this works. I can run this just as is and it's gonna create that article. Now, again, I'll probably tweak some stuff of this script. For example, JSON articles is hard-coded. So I might manually decide to tweak that to read it from a file or prompt me for a dialogue to upload a file. Or I can even tell AI to retry and to, to change that to include those things. But we can see that now I've gone from exporting, transforming, and outputting all with writing minimal manual code. AI essentially got me a starting point on all uh, the processes. All right, so content is now there. Sergey is now going to walk us through how Gen AI is making similar pivotal enhancements to code generation and migration. Thanks, Kevin. Um, hello, everyone. And uh, let me just start with this concept, concept of uh, prompt engineering, because Sitecore stack or not, this is, in essence, is uh, how we get Gen AI to generate the code we need or perform any kind of task that we need. Uh, and if I were to pick just one slide to communicate my part of the story, it would probably be this one. But uh, let me explain what I'm uh, what I'm trying to say here. Um, well, at this point, Gen AI is more of a co-pilot or an assistant. Uh, it's not some, something that can fully take over the entire migration process or any any kind of uh, complex process for that matter. Uh, we know this is changing soon, very soon, but we're just not there yet. All right, so. We need a pilot. We need uh, someone knowledgeable in both source and target platform, someone who knows what uh, he or she is doing, who would act as an actual pilot and would guide and direct the whole process. Um, so let's say I'm a pilot. I'm directing the process of migration. And my job is to instruct AI, or more specifically, a large language model. It is a generative AI. It's not a general AI yet. Uh, I need to tell it what needs to be done in a way that it can understand. Right? So it really comes down to three things where, when I'm doing uh, the, what is called the prompt engineering. is uh, First, I would need to prime my large language model, uh, provide instruction on how it needs to act. Right. So in the area of software engineering, I would say, hey, act as an expert in the given technical stocks, uh, Sitecore, Next.js, and so on and so forth. Um, I would then provide that necessary context, um, e.g. the solution code, the, the source code, the preferred libraries, uh, what, uh, and so on and so forth. And then finally, I would 
uh, fire up the specific uh, prompt. I would uh, ask it to do something specific uh, like every time uh, I want it to generate a page or a module or anything for me. So when the three things above are done right, uh, and that's what uh, that's 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 what we call the prompt engineering, and AI knows what needs to be done, then it can yield very very impressive results as of right now. And we know we know it's improving with every month with the breakneck speed. Right. So uh, let's move on to the next slide and uh, see how this can be applied to in in the context of uh, site core migration projects. Kevin, okay, if you can move on to the next slide. Right. So, uh, oh, no, previous slide, I'm sorry. Uh, so what what uh, do we actually do? Or what uh, would I say we found useful uh, when we use Gen AI as applied to site core migration projects? And uh, more specifically, we're moving on from site core nine and before to site core Maxon Cloud plus Next.js, right? Same contact, con Concepts can be applied to other technical stacks, but uh, I'm just going to uh, stick to uh, this uh, use case scenario. Uh, so we were going to explore three areas of code migration for this type of projects. Um, we're going to talk about code generation, which is uh, basically writing or generating new code from scratch or, say, using an, ex an, an existing spec. Uh, we're going to talk about converting code between tech stacks and platforms and languages. Uh, say from ASP.NET, MVC, C Sharp to TypeScript, Node.js, and so on. And then we briefly going to talk about checking, improving, and fixing an existing code where AI can um, act as a code assistant, as a code reviewer, and so on. Right. So let's take a look at some of the basic, uh, very high level examples of what I'm talking about here. Uh, so if we can move to the next slide. Uh, here I have an example of uh, quickly scaffolding. Um, okay or fast prototyping uh, a, a large functional area, right? So think uh, like a landing page or product or deals page or blogs or search, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so with uh, just a handful of prompts and in a matter of minutes or hours instead of uh, days and weeks, we can, we can quickly generate um, kind of big chunks of code which can then be used either a foundation or skeleton for the future solution, or it could be just something that we prototype. Because even if we migrate an existing uh, project to a new platform, more often than not, we are changing things and business uh, wants to update and re rearrange things or maybe come up with some new ideas. So that's where Gen AI makes uh, kind of prototyping so much more feasible because it can be done so much more quicker. Right? It's, it's a lot. It's a lot less expensive than, say, hand coding uh, this kind of things uh, the old way. So, uh, of course, it will take a number of follow-up prompt iterations. And here you can see uh, just the result of the first iteration, where I asked uh, my GitHub Copilot to generate the landing page and all the included components. And you see that it, it is very basic, right? So I would go through like five or ten iterations to flesh out the page. And a component, but uh, hopefully this gives you guys an idea on um, on how um, the, this process can be approached. So, uh, and the end result can really be a throwaway code used for experimenting and fast prototyping, uh, like I said. But it can also become a skeleton uh, for uh, for the future tasks. And some of them I'm going to um, explore in the following slides. So let's move on to the next one. Um, this is another example, and this is the code generation, not exactly from scratch. Uh, I am using the, the spec or, let's say, site core content item data source as a, as, a, as a starting point. So my item have a number of fields, and I'm, I'm asking AI to generate uh, the front end component. In this case, it's a carousel using just those fields. right? And you see how the first prompt gives me the result. And then um, to reiterate my previous point, uh, getting closer to a final version or even getting the final version would require a number of follow-up prompts where on each step I would refine, change something. Uh, for example, I would ask AI to add styles or maybe move styles to a CSS module. I would say use Tailwind instead of pure CSS. Um, I would say make it mobile friendly with Tailwind or Bootstrap or something else. Um, I would expand image uh, all 
to cover the whole slide. Uh, I would turn the entire slide into a clickable action link and so on and so forth. So each uh, point I made here is a prompt to Gen AI where a um, number a few seconds after it kind of spits out the result and then I keep refining and refining my result until I get something that I want to get out of it. So that in essence is another aspect of prompt engineering, iterative uh, approach. Right. Moving on to the next result, example. Um, kind of similar thing, but down to the backend modules. Here I'm asking Genii to create uh, the sitemap XML for XM Cloud, uh, or rather Node.js instance running against my XM Cloud instance. And uh, it might be hard to see, but uh, you can see it. It did generate GraphQL query in a separate file. It did generate the actual handler, the API handler. Uh, this um, this is not exactly. Uh, 100% functional, it will need some fixing, but you can see like how with just a few follow-up props or maybe manual changes, this can actually become the, the ready-to-use API. Right? So uh, moving on to the next example, uh, code conversion. Right? So uh, this is where I found um, there are some caveats to this, and the caveats are mostly around the, the source code. Right? So um, the Gen AI will always give us an answer. It will always do what we ask it to do, or it will try, right? It will hallucinate this way to, to the answer. Uh, the, the potential pitfall here is that poorly written source code will translate to, into poorly written results, right? So if we, and we know there more often than not, we have some kind of a technical depth uh, in the older solution. So in the case of code migration, um, like if I know, and this is again my, my is my role as a, as a actual pilot or someone who directing uh, the process. I need to know what I'm doing with Gen AI. I will it will do whatever I ask it to do. But if I know my source code is poorly written, then instead of just asking my AI to translate it word to word, I would ask it to just uh, extract the essence of the existing code, be it a front end module or the back end, and uh, write it in kind of in a better way following the best practices in a way that fits the target platform in the best way, right? So that, that would be a more complex and longer prompt, but uh, uh, but yeah, that would need to be done. So downright, this can be a huge, huge saver to in the migration process with lots of components which can be translated one-to-one, -one, which you know, we, it may or may not be the case, right? Uh, moving on to the next example, uh, backend module. Uh, so here, this is a kind of fictional API. I just made it super simple to illustrate the point, but uh, I have the uh, ISP.NET MVC service uh, translated with just one simple prompt into a Node.js service, right? So this is more along the lines of the word-to-word -word translation, but you can see how uh, AI or GitHub Copilot more specifically is aware, uh, it may be hard to see, but it is aware about using the GraphQL client. It knows how to generate Node.js modules, right? So it's not exactly word to word. It actually does take the um, the target platform into the consideration. And that is kind of going back to my point of providing the context, right? In this case, when I'm running this in GitHub Copilot, GitHub Copilot already knows uh, what is the target technology stack that we use Node.js, that we use TypeScript. It does a lot of assumptions based on uh, the context of the project that is running in. Okay. Uh, now moving on to the next point, and this I think will conclude our code section. Uh, but the code reviews, refactorings, bug fixes, uh, this I found to be tremendously useful and helpful uh, because I have some years of experience in software engineering. I think I can write a good code when I need to, but I found Gen AI, Gen AI is always finding, right, almost always finding potential issues or performance challenges or some things that I just didn't think about, right? So um, again, it's, it, there's a lot uh, I needed to fit on the screen, but uh, uh, in this case, my prompt is very detailed. It is an instruction that I would, kind of have as a, as a as a bullet list for myself, right? So these are the things to look for in an existing code and boom, it spits out not only the code suggestion, but you can see at the very bottom of it, it generates out the, the actual fixed uh, code file. So uh, very useful technique. 
Now, uh, this concludes our code coding session section. Uh, so I'm just going to breeze through a couple of remaining slides because we want to answer some questions. Um, if we can move to the next slide, uh, I'm not going to speak to this one. Here, I just wanted to say that there are lots of and lots of tools. Uh, well, on the previous slide, uh, where it comes to AI, this area is booming, and I personally am, am using GitHub Copilot and ChatGPT the most. But there's there are very very many tools that uh, help with all kinds of aspects of the code engineering as well as other things. And then moving on to the next slide, um, I have some takeaways and best practices. Um, so I think rather than kind of reading what's already on the screen. Um, I can kind of let uh, let the answers, uh, questions, and answers come in. Uh, Thanks, Sergey. So yeah, if you have a question or you just want to, you know, learn a little bit more, feel free to drop it in, and I'll read them out, and then we'll, we'll kind of just start going through those. Oh, no questions. Oh, here we go. Oh, well, thank you. It's not a question, it's a statement, but I'll take it. <laughs> and if you're trying to ask your question through your mic, I don't think that's going to work, unfortunately. Yeah, maybe one point I would like to make is uh, we 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 kind of crafted this presentation based on our experience of using GenAI in the actual projects. So if you're thinking about migrating or even creating new projects with the help of GenAI, um, there are some things that we might be able to answer. Okay, so we have a good question here. So it says, are there any concerns with exposing proprietary content and code with tools like ChatGPT? And that's, I can give it a stab and Sergey, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this as well. It definitely is a concern. I wouldn't necessarily want to take proprietary code and feed it in uh, that then it will turn around and consume it. I know some models do have options like ChatGPT. You can tell it, hey, don't use my prompts for your training. Don't retain that data. Of course, there's a little bit of trust that goes with that setting, right? You're trusting that they're adhering to that, but that's a valid concern. And I would say, you know, if you're gonna leverage AI, one, understand what type of privacy settings they have to see if they do have options that respect that. And if not, a lot of times you can abstract away your prompts from a proprietary piece of code. Like for example, a lot of what we showed, some of the conversion might be considered proprietary because that's full fledged code. But as far as generating brand new scripts or content, a lot of times you don't have to even give it anything other than just, here's what I need from you. But Sergey, do you wanna, do you have anything yeah. to add to that? Yeah, well, yes, absolutely, there are concerns because uh, let's say Microsoft was running GitHub Copilot, they absolutely collect all the data points and information and input and output. They they use it to train their model. Uh, Microsoft owns GitHub, right? So they they are using all this information. Uh, the way around it would be Microsoft provides it, for example, uh, GitHub Copilot Pro uh, Corporate, where uh, you can restrict the access that that Microsoft have and uh, how much data it can actually retain. Right? And similar to uh, like with chat GPT models, you can restrict, uh, there are ways to restrict what it will retain for its purposes. And then the, the, the third way would be to basically host and run your own chat GPT or Codex or other large language models in your Azure instance, in, in which case you're going to own all the data. And Azure AI provide you this uh, capability. That's a super short answer. It's it's a big, broad question, though. It's a lot, a lot in the short answer. So here's one that I think, Sergey, you'd be great to to tackle. And uh, you know, this this UI is, is horrendous. I can barely see who asked it, so I apologize for not calling that out. But the question was, if we don't use GitHub, but rather Azure DevOps, what would be the best Gen AI tool? There are lots of them. It depends on the task at hand. Uh, 
GitHub Copilot, even though it has the word GitHub in it, you don't have to use it with GitHub. It just have visibility into your code. Call it Copilot. I think Microsoft will rename it eventually. Uh, you can also use ChatGPT. You can, uh, you, there, there are so many um, AI tools that you can use kind of through the browser. Uh, the advantage of using Copilot is that it does have access to, uh, to, you, to your entire solution code, right? So I found it very useful for the coding tasks. But other tasks can absolutely done, be done with uh, different tools. And uh, I actually have a slide with a, a number of AI tools, but uh, where it comes to large language models, general use, I think it's uh, the chat GPT would be a number one choice. It's the most powerful model as of right now. All the competition is not too far behind. And a lot of these tools end up using open AI, you know, chat GPT's kind of backend system to then build on top of. And I think that that kind of leads to the next question perfectly. The question is, is the AI tool learning over time to understand the context of migration and avoid to repeat context definition? And I'll, I'll give a short answer and I'm sure I'll hand it over to Sergey. Uh, we've both been playing with this and I would say yes. So based on what tool, Right, and I think Sergey can probably talk through a bit more bespoke tool that you're training yourself and that you're giving it that context. So it does that one thing really well. You can also do that with with tools that exist. Right, for me personally, I see the biggest value of really understanding all the hard work that these data scientists have put into the tools and see how I can extract the most value. So again, ChatGPT, there is a settings pa panel where you can tell it, hey, when you respond. Here's the context you should always use. You're always going to be talking about Sitecore. The output code is going to be TypeScript and Next.js. And I use that extensively. Uh, it's relatively vague because I use my AI or my ChatGPT kind of uh, account for many things. So I don't have it too narrowed down. But you can definitely give it, hey, here are your constraints. As a system, here's what you are. Every question that comes in always account for this context. And, and I know here we're running on time, but Sergey, I want to give you time to answer this. And um, I just want to be mindful of that. So uh, if you have to drop on me, please, you know, feel free to do so. Um, it, the, the AI, the large language models, they evolve at a breakneck speed, like way, way faster than we humans, which is kind of scary. Uh, you, as far as learning, um, yeah, the, the, the super short answer would be like, you can fine tune your model to perform, to, to perform the specific tasks, you can provide context. Uh, there are different ways of providing con the context, and you can take a step of training your own models. If you or rather fine tuning, training is very expensive, but fine tuning is is probably the answer in like ninety percent of the cases. I know yeah. it's, it's a it, very short answer. I mean, it's 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 true, right? All of these can be almost all webinars by themselves, all right? So I think these are a lot of good questions and we actually have a lot of good ones here queued up, but we are at time and I hate to run over. Uh, so if, I, I'd love to keep this going. So please reach out, uh, we're gonna send this deck out and it's gonna have some contact information for Accentium in general, but also Sergey and myself. So please reach out, you know, send us the questions. I'd love to keep this going. You know, we're really passionate about it. We're learning a lot and we're hoping that you do too. And then we just start sharing that knowledge back and forth. So uh, I'd just like to say, thank you for joining. I really appreciate your time and and hopefully we're, we'll connect soon. And maybe one, one more point I think we did make is we are actually looking into uh, making more webinars to explore uh, various topics um, to be announced, but uh, we already have a pipeline of ideas to, to talk about next time. Absolutely. Now, it's up to me to figure out how to stop this. <laughs> Sorry, guys, I'll find the button.